So first, I'd like to introduce Rochelle Constantine. She is a, a conservation biologist and behavioral ecologist at the School of Biology, Biological Sciences, uh, an institute of marine science at University of Auckland in New Zealand, where she is holding an associate professorship. Her studies are focused on uh, marine megafauna, whales, dolphins, sharks, and seabirds. And we are very pleased to uh, have you here and that you stay out late tonight and um, by being on the other side of the globe and talk uh, to us about uh, cetacean tourism and it takes time and space. So welcome, Rochelle, the floor is yours. Tak, Jonas. Okay, um, first, hi everybody, I'm Rochelle. Um, I think first off, I'd just really like to acknowledge the tough times that most of us are facing at the moment in the world. In New Zealand, we hear a lot about the rest of the world and I, I hope everyone's doing okay. And I'm really grateful that we can actually stay connected as a community this way. So uh, today I'm going to talk about boat-based and swim-with cetacean tourism. And this is a really lucrative business throughout the world, but it's one that we have a lot of challenges with. It's, it's, um, there's a lot of different types of tourism. I acknowledge there's land-based and aerial, uh, you know, aircraft-based tourism as well around cetaceans, but I'm just going to focus on the boat-based tourism, which is the majority of it. When I when I talk about tourism, I agree with Finkler and Hyam that we're at this point where we really need to move beyond the, the sort of binary narrative of whaling is bad and, and tourism, tourism, whale watch tourism is good. You know, we acknowledge that. And I think we need to acknowledge the sort of good and bad practices that go on within tourism. We have so much knowledge within this industry that we can actually make, ensure we have as little impact as possible. And there's a lot of things that we've ignored for several decades now. And there are two key things that we do know makes a difference, and that's time and space. And I'm going to sort of touch on that as I go through today's talk. I struggled to write this talk. It took me quite a while because there's actually a real huge amount of information, not just about the biology and behavior, but there's also a lot of social and economic information within the literature. And so I've just chosen a few key examples and papers, and um, I acknowledge all of you out there who are actually doing a lot of work in this space. So, oh, move. You're gonna go. Oh, and now it's not gonna progress. One moment. There we go. So um, basically, it's global gold. Uh, the International Whaling Commission have made this really helpful handbook about whale watching. And you can see here all the countries in the world that are IWC members who have uh, whale watch tourism of some kind. In Europe, there's around four, over 40% 40, 40 of species of cetaceans found in European waters. And, and so tourism is also very lucrative uh, in, in the ECS neck of the world as well. What do the tourists want? Well, they want close, beautiful encounters, a very long time with these animals. They want to feel like they've made a, a personal connection to them in a private space and bonded. But the reality is, is actually a lot different. And we can see you know, images like these, the gray whales that come very close to people in Baja, um, California, and Mexico. They have excellent whale watch guidelines. They have training for guides and government issued permits. And then these sort of apparently rare occurrences of the gray whales coming up to people and they pat them. These are the things that people remember. And this is the kind of tourism think people think they're going to get. But the reality is that there's usually a lot of boats crowded around and just one little dolphin somewhere in there. And in the case of this you know, bottom figure, there's actually a group of 14 dolphins, but there's just one leaping about and that's who everyone's busy focusing on. So the reality of what the tourists want and what they get is quite different. They want satisfaction guaranteed. They want to feel satisfied with their experience. And they want to have a great trip. They want to see the dolphins and whales, porpoises, living their normal lives and doing what they're doing. But the interesting thing is that satisfaction often for tourists isn't just about seeing the animals. It's actually about having a calm ocean, a nice boat, a pleasant experience when they were greeted on the boat, good uh, educational information. And it's actually really complicated. So it's not just about the animals that can make 
the tour experience. And I think one of the, the big challenges that we have is that marketing of tourism, the sort of up close and personal, is really powerful. So here's an example from Iceland, where they've got, you know, really well established tourism of, you know, pretty good quality. And yet, if you look at these images online, this is what people think they're going to get. And this is what people sort of expect. And the marketers provide that. Yet, us as scientists know that the up close and personal can have quite a negative impact on the animals. So there's been a lot of really interesting work done around that tourists will actually sacrifice their personal experience, that up close, um, uh, seeing the animals for a long period of time, if they know that they can minimize the harm to these animals. So if they know there's some impact of them being very close to these animals, they don't want that. They actually want to do the right thing. So there's this kind of conflict between what the marketers tell them, what they think they're personally going to experience. But then the flip side is, but we don't want to cause any harm to them. And I think that's really interesting because it's about these sort of decisions that people make when they engage in tourism. And there's this really nice um, solution, I think, to the conundrum, and, and Simon Allen wrote this in one of his papers, that you know, to address this, it ultimately requires science communication programs that can influence responsible behavior change and practices of operators and whale watchers. So it's up to the operators to give what's best for the animals, and in turn, that will be what's best for the tourists as well, and they will accept it. One of the really big justifications you often hear for running tourism is that, oh, it's educational. People learn. And if they learn to love things and the things they love, then they will save the planet, right? So if they go out, see whales, dolphins in the wild, then they will want to do things that protect our ocean environment, reduce climate change, plastic pollution, insert your conservation issue of choice for the marine space. There's quite a few to choose from. So it's quite interesting. We know that people, tourists want education and they want to learn about the cetaceans, but not just them. They also want to learn about the marine environment as well. And I picked these two particular papers by um, Misha Luke because this was actually the same place that he did the study in 2003. And then he went back and published again in 2019 and still found that the motivations of the tourists were the same, but the lackings of the company were still the same. And so here we are 16 years later, and they hadn't quite managed to fill those educational gaps in the eyes of the tourists. We know that participation alone in seeing cetacean does not leave a lasting impact on people's conservation outlook. They might remember the next day, they might intend to join a, you know, a, NGO, they might um, go do a beach cleanup, whatever it might be, but very quickly they will forget about that and they'll forget about their experience. So education is really important because, you know, just wanting to do the right thing, having a nice day out and having a nice, you know, good feel day is, is actually not going to make a really big difference. So I guess the question is, you know, for the industry, should education be a compulsory um, part uh, of, of all cetacean watch or cetacean engagement tourism? And should formal training or, you know, it be demanded that the, the guides be highly educated in marine science in some way that they can actually undertake, uh, or not even marine science, even just as science communicators, where they can actually teach people and do it properly. And could this be a condition of the management conditions of that particular industry, be they voluntary or government regulated? In New Zealand, um, education is actually the key reason why permits are issued, yet there's no formal assessment of the quality of that. And even the best operators in New Zealand, which is often seen as a country that you know, has pretty good standards, have little long-term impact on the behavioral change by participants. So I think this is something that needs to be really thought about, um, that we, you know, that we get education right. Otherwise, it's just entertainment, you know, and I think these are important questions for us to answer. There are many, 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 many ways of managing or not managing cetacean-based tourism. Uh, some of them are, are written into the laws of the country. Some of them are voluntary codes of con conduct or guidelines. Um, there are talks about uh, having eco-certification. You'll see certain zones, time restrictions, all kinds of different things. 
the early work by Paul Forrestal still actually holds one of the most important things that we need in the industry is stability. Once you get permitted or, or a, 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 a a tourism business established in an area, the sooner that that can become stable and those, those boats and companies learn how to work together on the water for the best interests of the animals, you actually, generally it works out better for, for the animals involved. Often a, a lack of uptake of management approaches is because rules are developed in a non-participatory manner. So there's not sort of this inclusive decision-making this is particularly obvious um, in areas where species may hold cultural importance for indigenous communities, for example, and so, like a pure business management approach is actually not suitable because there is a different connection to the animals. There's often poor uptake of, uh, by industry of research findings. You know, I think research informed uh, decisions around how to manage industry is really important, but if the, if the operators are not engaged in that process in some way, they can often sit back and, and not really, you know, uh, care or, or pick up what, you know, we as scientists are often putting down for them. James Hyam often talks about the socio-political aspects, and it's usually only these get addressed when, when it's a bit too late, when the industry is falling apart or there's a lot of conflict between business. Uh, you know, what we do know is often people want to do the right thing, but they don't often know exactly what the right thing is. So whale watching, boat-based tourism is the most common form of whale, dolphin, porpoise watching their uh, interactions. So tour boats, tour boats have a bigger impact than any other type of boat, recreational boats or non-permitted or non-focused tourism boats. And we know that cetaceans in, in pretty much all studies perceive boats as a risk or a threat and that they respond to that in turn. And there's been some nice reviews around this. And it's a really fine line between habituation and tolerance. So often animals will stay in an area, but just because they're there doesn't mean that they're okay with the activities that are going on. And they may actually, the consequences of that, you know, are, are quite different. If they don't have a choice to go anywhere else and they have to stay, levels of stress may be elevated um, and the impact on these animals is often unseen, especially for the long-lived slow breeding animals. A review by Senegalia um, and colleagues showed that disruptions to activity budgets, um, path directionality, there's a whole bunch of a suite of standard stuff <laughs> that now is covered in almost all publications on uh, tourism impact. And we know these responses are pretty consistent towards whale watching vessels and that these behavioral changes are now sort of typical and norm. We see similarities across species and locations. We know that the impact reduces with distance. So the further you away from the animals you go, the less impact the vessel has. But then we end up in that, that catch-22 where the marketers show all the pictures of everyone up close. And that's often what people want. All of these sort of findings have been so since research began back in, well, back in the 80s, looking at these. And yet we're still seeing the same thing. So there's some disconnect between what we know and what's happening. So I'm just going to show you a few very quick examples from the many, many studies that show impact. Um, Alain Schaffer and, and colleagues found that tour boats and uh, working, uh, observing humpback whales in the New Caledonia Southern Lagoon, they spent more time with animals on average. So the tour boats are here in, um, in black. So they are more likely to stay for longer periods of time. As a result, um, in recent years, New Caledonia has tightened um, their the restrictions around the industry, number of boats, operating time, time spent with animals, and they've actually really stabilized the number of vessels operating, and it's actually made a really big difference, and the, reduce, the, the impact has been you know, quite significantly reduced for the humpback whales, which is great news. The killer whales in British Columbia region are, are probably some of the, the best known whales that are uh, whale watch studied. Um, Rob Williams and colleagues have, have been studying them for quite some time and, and looked at activity budgets here. And so you can see when boats are present, they change their behavioral budgets. In the case of this study, the whales really reduce their time spent feeding and at rubbing beaches, which are very important for this population. And these lost feeding opportunities have resulted in about 
an 18% reduction in um, energy intake by the whales. So there is a cost to them. And the more tourism there is, the more impact there is on these critical life behaviours. Swimming with dolphins and whales has, has sort of increased in popularity over time, but it's not really commonplace. It doesn't occur everywhere. And this, this image here is um, from Lars Beider, uh, provided to me um, from Kealakakua Bay. Typically, we see three swimmer placements. So um, the boat will go past the animals off to the side and the swimmers will get in the water off to the side, known as line abreast. Or otherwise, the, um, the dolphins will often be interacting with the boat, uh, bow riding, and then the, the boat will stop and the, the swimmers will get in the water sort of on top of the dolphins. So this is an interesting one because the dolphins are clearly engaging with the boat in some way and then the swimmers enter the water. And then the last one is in path where the boat drives directly in front of the animals and the swimmers get in the water. These placements are pretty much standard throughout the world and um, the outcomes have been pretty much the same as well since we first studied, started studying this. So this was some early work that I did on swim with bottlenose dolphins in the Bay of Islands in New Zealand. So you can see here that there are three placements, line abreast, in path and around boat that match with this here. Then there are three options by the dolphins. They can avoid in grey, they can have a neutral approach, no apparent change in direction uh, in white, and then they can interact in black. And these, um, again, are pretty standard placements with pretty standard responses by the animals. Over time, the dolphins have become sensitized to the swimmers. So you can see the line of breast was the best placement in 94, 95 when I started working on this. In path was not the best one. It had um, pretty high avoidance rate and the lowest interaction rate. And then around boat, it actually had a reasonably high interaction rate, but um, they still avoided. Basically, the dolphins get a fright because they think they're bow riding and then all of a sudden a whole bunch of people get in the water on top of them. Just even if they get in quietly, they still get a fright. They're not expecting that at all. And when I went back and looked at this, only a few years later, the line of breast still remained the best placement. There'd actually been a reduction in interactions, but also a reduction in avoidance. In path just got worse, fewer interactions and a massive increase in avoidance. And the around boat um, also had uh, an, an increase in avoidance. So basically, you know, the take home messages, swimmers should just get in the water line of breast. This is the only placement that gives the dolphins the choice um, to interact. And this should be the only placement ever used in the world for, for swim attempts. No matter what species it is, this is what should happen. One of the interesting things is that even when there is a swim, not all individuals are, uh, are willing to interact or interested in interacting. In the case of the bottlenose dolphins, only 19% of the group um, would interact, and most of the time they were juveniles or sub-adults. Those animals that don't have a care in the world, they're not breeding yet, they're not rearing offspring or completing for access for mates, and they're the ones most likely to engage in this sort of more risk-taking behaviour. But the reality is that swims occur when 81% of the dolphins didn't want to do it. They didn't want to be around the swimmers and they didn't want to engage. And yet swimming with has continued to remain a popular activity. On both coasts of Australia, they've recently started swimming with humpback whales. Despite some expert and very good um, advice that they shouldn't start doing it. So recent work by Kate Sprogis um, and team have revealed that the whales have changed their behaviour in response to these swim attempts. So operators, they looked at um, before uh, there was a swim attempt. So uh, changes in travelling and resting um, swim speeds in particular, the animals increase their swim speeds. Operators place swimmers in the path of the whale's direction of travel in 90% of interactions. And that uh, it just really has quite, a, quite the impact on the whales. They deviate from their movement trajectory. They will dive to get away or they'll move away um, sort of in a, a vertical avoidance strategy as well. During the in-path approaches, the vessels um, travel significant, significantly faster than approaches from the side. So everything is, is ramped up for these animals. In addition, there is increased um, 
there you go, agonistic behaviors with proximity, um, the boat's proximity. So if, as, if the boat's within 100 meters of the whales, they increase these sort of competitive agonistic behaviors um, and that decreases uh, as the boat moves further away. There's been some serious injuries to swimmers recently as well. And so, I, you know, I just think Australia's got this wrong. They, they started only, you know, a few years ago um, not that long ago, and yet they've basically done everything that you shouldn't do to manage their industry, and they really do need to go back to the drawing board and start again. Not all swim with activities are negative, though. Um, again, in Australia, there's the swim with dwarf minke whales. So um, this is in the Great Barrier Reef area. Swimmers enter the water and they hold on to this line. They're not allowed to let go of the line and swim away from it to, to swim after the whales. So these whales are, um, you know, approach the swimmers. So some work by Mangat et al. found that the, the whales actually surface close to the vessel. So you've got the um, observed and expected here. And the whales regularly come over towards the vessel. And of course, this line is attached to the vessel and they come very close to the swimmers. In addition, they will actually come to that part of the vessel. So they're not just coming to the vessel itself, but they're actually coming to the area where there are the ropes and swimmers more often than expected. So this inquisitiveness is, is a bit of an issue because it creates some management challenges and compliance um, difficulties. You know, uh, there are permitted and non-permitted operators, but when you have highly curious whales, as some of these minkies are, enough to for this to be sort of normal kind of behavior. Um, the strong attraction to people is an interesting dilemma for them to manage, but they are keeping an eye on it. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, case study. Lars Beider and I have been working on tourism stuff forever. He, he started out down here in, in New Zealand working on the, the uh, Hector's dolphins when I was working on the bottlenose. And we've spent many years now, since last century, we are getting on a bit now, thinking about these things. So in 1991, I went to Kealakakua Bay in Hawaii on the Big Island and saw the spinner dolphins with Baron Wurzig, who had done many, many, many years of work there um, prior to, to me ever visiting. And this, there was an issue then with people getting in the water too close and swimming with uh, spinner dolphins. Recent work, detailed work, um, led by um, Julian Tyne, uh, and you know who was working with Lars at the time, they um, found that these dolphins have about 83% of their time um, with people within 100 meters of them. So the dolphins, the spinner dolphins, come into these bays to rest during the day, and they go offshore at night to feed. And so this is a, a massive amount of human activity, swimming and boats, kayaks, all kinds of different um, vessels around the animals. <sighs> The challenge is that the United States under their Marine Mammals Protection Act, they have this, it's a, you're not allowed to harass the animals. And so it's very clear that harassment is occurring here, but it's really difficult to gather evidence of what that is. And often they've been um, sort of resistant, there's resistance from lawyers to prosecute anyone because it is really tricky thing to, to prove harassment. You know, you get the standard, oh, well, if they don't like it, they could just leave. So NOAA uh, changed their management approach um, it had time area closures that wasn't working. So they've changed to a 50 yard no approach rule, which is currently um, under consideration. The thing is, the challenge is, how does the US with their legislative approach actually manage this industry? You know, it becomes a real, real challenge. Recently, these um, resting bays have been declared um, important marine mammal areas under the IUCN um, uh, designation. And so maybe this global recognition of the importance may afford greater protection to the dolphins. So no matter what species or what place, there are a lot of management challenges around swim with be above and beyond the boats, because most of the time the swimmers get in the water from a boat, although there are some that go from land. We know that unless the dolphins are given a choice and have that space to choose to come over and that time to rest, so you simply can't have this level of pressure that the spinner dolphins have, um, the impact on the population is too great. So 
if you can give them the space, get in the waterline abreast and minimize the number of swim attempts and companies doing this, then perhaps this can be a viable industry. But unfortunately, this very rarely happens. The thing is that we know that um, cetacean-based tourism can transform communities. It's been a real game changer throughout the world. It, in New Zealand, Kaikoura, where it started in, in the late 1980s, it was a, uh, it just took this very small, quiet, sleepy, really, fishing village into a multi-million dollar um, town that it just makes so much money through sperm whale watching and dusky dolphin uh, swim countries like New Zealand, but throughout the world, we know that it can make a real difference to people's lives and give them, you know, other ways of earning revenue from their marine resources, which can remove pressure from, for example, overfishing from communities. So getting that mixture right for the quality and quantity and ensuring that the wealth is sort of distributed throughout the communities are actually really important things. That money that's coming in is reinvested in the businesses or within the community improve standards. Um, and also providing educational and cultural connections that don't compromise the importance of traditional knowledge. And it's really tough to balance all of these things. You've got a really complex mix of of things that need to happen when you have tourism in your in your area. So I've got a few examples here. So in the Chileka Lagoon in India, they have um, tourism established for 10 years, focused on the Irrawaddy dolphin. So you can see here, there's a, a small vessel, a local vessel and a dolphin there in the circle. Dilemma et al found that the tourists were mostly inexperienced and they were pretty dissatisfied with their whale watching, uh, their dolphin watching experience. Um, a lot of them were local, but there were also uh, international tourists as well. The thing is that what was the um, people were struggling with was the lack of infrastructure, proper, you know, facilities, toilets, places where they could, you know, get good food. Um, and also there was not a lot of safety measures, simple things like life jackets that are, are standard throughout a lot of the world now when undertaking these kinds of tours. And they actually affected people's perception of the, uh, the quality of these trips. And so the, the num you know, tourism has declined after 10 years of being well established, numbers have been dropping. And so I think this highlights sort of the importance of all aspects of a of for tourism, but it also highlights some of the challenges with, you know, rural developing world kind of context. And although they have a code of conduct, it's voluntary and there's no enforcement. And that enforcement is the thing that often, you know, is the real sticking point. You can have all the rules in the world, but if a few people cheat, then often others will cheat as well and, and it can fall apart pretty quickly. I think, you know, in the Chileka Lagoon area, you know, one of the things is, is how to work to ensure that the businesses can remain viable um, for, you know, going forward. Another area is Zanzibar in Tanzania. There's been many years of research. Um, per Berggren started the work there with many of his colleagues from the area. And using small traditional fishing boats, a community collective was established to sort of manage the industry and manage revenue so that um, people, you know, were getting a share of, of time on the water and revenue from tourists. This hasn't really succeeded in the impacts on the Indo-Pacific um, dolphins and the humpback dolphins that they also sometimes watch. They have small, very small resident populations. And recent abundance estimate for the, the humpback population uh, that although not deliberately targeted for tourism are often cited was 19 dolphins. And their problem there is that there's still quite high levels of bycatch from fisheries. So you've got the sort of double whammy with this tourism impact as well as fisheries bycatch. And so this well-established industry is, is not quite getting it right and, and things need to change or otherwise what will happen is, you know, they won't have any industry if, if the numbers continue to decline. The last example I have is Lovina in Bali in Indonesia, um, where they uh, do watching spinner dolphins. And it started in the late 1980s. And Putaliza Mistika and her colleagues have done a lot of really interesting work there, especially around the social economic um, aspects, as well as um, the biology and behavior of these animals. And they have fixed price tours in Lovina. And boatmen earn 1.3 to 1.8 times 
um, the annual revenue for the region. So it's worth a lot of money. It's very lucrative. And there's a lot of uh, infrastructure that is supported because of tourism. So it brings a lot of money into the, the local economy. But there are over 100 boats doing these tours now. And so there's a lot of concern about how to regulate that so they actually embrace conservation policies and don't kind of, you know, things get worse. With the current lack of global tourism, it's possible that many jobs have already been lost um, in these places, making challenges for local people. But we also know that in turn, that makes lives better for the dolphins and whales when we're not adding pressure to them. So back to the time and space thing. Well, whale watching is, it's a real challenge. It, 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 sort of, it targets specific communities of animals that are repeatedly sought after for prolonged encounters. In 2008, Lars and I wrote a, uh, a chapter calling for a paradigm shift in the industry where the pressure is taken off regulators and um, scientists to prove that there's impact and instead it's put back on the industry to prove that if they do this they're not going to have an impact. Um, I quite like this, I quite like this uh, <laughs> this quote that I just read in a paper by Rocha et al, cetacean-based tourism is often confused with sustainable tourism. And I thought that was quite, quite, quite a good quote. <laughs> it sort of sums it up quite nicely. And when you look at, you know, the, the work by Eric Hoyt that's been done for so many years in the space, often with, you know, very wise, thoughtful summaries of things, basically, if we have a well-managed industry that's science-informed, conservation and education focused and looks after operators and community relations, then it should work. And we can, you know, we continue to see these things, yet we still sometimes get it wrong. So I'm just gonna finish up with back to the Bay of Islands because this is the place that I've been working on since 1993 when I started my work there with Scott Baker. New Zealand has a legally binding permitting system under legislation. The population I study is completely depleted now. It's a non-resident year-round population, so they move outside the bay. But we did used to have large numbers of them. They range um, in and out of the bay. At peak, there was up to 70 trips per week. Remember that the swims, the dolphins started avoiding the swimmers. They became sensitized to swims. And it's because very few individuals interacted. We know that the permitted boats have a greater impact on dolphins' behaviour than non-permitted boats. And more permitted boats increased the impact. We also know from um, my student Liz Hartle's work that the dolphins completely shifted the core parts of their range. So in red, the top, you can see the core parts of their range. And then about 10 or 10 plus years later, they, they had shifted. Um, so the Bay of Islands became a suboptimal habitat for these dolphins. As a result, the Department of Conservation, who regulates it, changed permit conditions. They put time restrictions, increased no-go areas. They made a moratorium on new permits. But they had a four-year delay in acting on all of this information. And they also had little to no enforcement, which that was the point in the early 2000s where it all changed. From 1997 to 2006, there was a 7.5% annual decline in abundance of dolphins. That continued through 2009 to 2012. At the highest um, abundance, we had around 240 dolphins using the bay at some point throughout the year in 97. In 2012, there was only 24 dolphins using the bay. The Department of Conservation has 2020, they've said they've got 26 identifiable individuals, but no estimate. So basically, since around 2012, the numbers have been extremely low. The apparent survival, and that's the uh, combination of, of uh, immigration and deaths, has gone from 0.93, which is about normal for bottlenose populations. Um, and from 2009 to 2013, it's down at 0.63. These dolphins have one calf every four years. We have really low calf survival, and that's just getting lower. And between 2012 and 2015, of the 12 calves born, only three survived. So it's not looking that great. There's a new proposal to protect the area fully with people needing to be uh, 400 meters away from dolphins. 
and I, I don't really know, I think it might be too little too late, these dolphins have displaced. So the Bay of Islands has become a suboptimal habitat, habitat for them. So many of them have moved to other areas that are now the core part of their range because of there's too much pressure on them. Um, and they're not really moving back in. And the dolphins that are left clearly are not doing very well, possibly due to stress, as we saw with the Shark Bay dolphins. There's huge loss, cultural loss. The local Māori who live there, these dolphins, they believe, carry the spirits of their dead to the northern part of New Zealand where their spirits depart for Hawaiki. And for the Māori in this area, there's a massive cultural loss. And that's something that I think hasn't really been understood well. So to wrap up, is cetacean-based tourism now a welfare issue? The IWC many years ago <laughs> talked about, you know, compelling evidence about the impacts of, of cetacean-based tourism. We know there are consequences on individuals and populations. We know that the, it uh, disrupts social networks. It has disproportionate effect on, on females often who uh, have lowered breeding success. We also know that that these impacts and the actual understanding what is causing these impacts, you know, at a physiological level are really hard to, to measure. There are some new tools and techniques coming into play to do that. But tourism is definitely a sublethal anthropogenic stressor and we must manage it as such. We need to have integrative um, management and adaptive management that can, can move around with, you know, species and location. It's not a one size fits all. And if we get all the parts, working parts right, then perhaps industries can be sustainable. It is possible, but it is a challenge. There's been recent attempts to use um, models such as the PCOD models. And, and, and most recently, this paper came out by Nickel, who was looking at the development of a functional welfare assessment tool for wild cetaceans for a number of stresses, but this also included tourism. It comes down to time and space. We know what to do. We've got lots of science. We know exactly what to do. So we really should get on and do it. And we really, really must do better for these cetaceans because there are so many pressures on their lives uh, anyway without us adding entertainment to that list of pressures. So I think it's a challenge for us as scientists to work out how to articulate this and how to put this into action. Thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Roussel, for this um, extremely interesting and important uh, talk. Um, we have a lot of questions now. And uh, as you probably all aware that uh, you can vote on each question uh, in the Q&As. So the top one will be, uh, will be uh, answered first. And we have one here from uh, Jerome Hoffs. So the question is, there are multiple situations in which the organization, organizers of cetacean-based tourism are not as well educated and the tour guide skippers seem to go out of their way to get the tourists as close as possible to cetaceans. Uh, now the question moved <laughs> um, with negative consequences. However, as you said, tourists not generally want to disturb the animals. Would you say there's often a mismatch between what tourists want and what organizers of these trips think tourists want. Yeah, absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head. It, um, one of the really interesting things is that if you can imagine that the operators go out every day or however many times a week they go out. So for them, what they see is normal at very they don't have that thrill and rush of they've saved their money, they've bought an expensive ticket, they're going out to see cetaceans for the first time, which is what most tourists do. And um, so for the tourist, it is an incredibly exciting event. For the operators, it's just another day at work and it very rapidly becomes normalized. So you get that shifting baseline of often what the guides and skippers think is an exciting tour. And they're actually trying to f increase what they think is an exciting tour. They're not actually acting to the wishes of the tourists. And one of the things in the Bay of Islands is that when I started out working, the operators would spend on average just under an hour with the dolphins. 
easily 90% of the tourists were sitting down after about 20 minutes. They had had the most amazing experience. They had loved their time and they were done. There might be a few tourists still up the front looking at the animals, but most everyone was sitting, yet they stayed for so much longer. And so that was one of the reasons why the interaction time got reduced in the Bay of Islands, but the damage was done. And I, I totally agree. These it's almost like these decisions should be taken out of the hands of the operators and guides and very strict, clear guidelines put around it because they're not in a position to judge. Thank you. Now we have a question from Lisa. It says, uh, when, when is education most effective? I'm a guide and, final, uh, and find that people don't always pay attention to the pre-trip briefing because they ask the questions on the boat that I've already explained. I do of, co uh, of course answer them again. And on the boat, especially if they are animals, they're not really listening either. After the trip, they are often keen to be uh, on their way and their next activity. I usually fill the, the waiting time with facts. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, qu the question is, when is education most effective on these tours? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not an education expert, but there's a lot of really good papers coming out. Um, Wiebke Finkler and uh, James Hyam, particularly at University of Otago, but there are others around the world who've, who've actually looked at science communication, how to do it most effectively and how to, where are the key points in time. And sometimes when... <laughs> you don't think people are listening, they are listening. And that's one of the really hard things with being a teacher, which is what good guides are trying to be. Um, I think in these modern times, giving people, it's Vibka did some, some work around providing a short video that people could watch at their leisure before they came so that they had their expectations set of what was going to happen on the tour and um, and some sort of advice and but allowing people to watch that when they felt like it it seemed that that is likely to work better yeah um, I just I just have a look around in the literature there's a lot of really good stuff about science communication and take your chance from there it sounds like you're thinking about it so you're miles ahead of a lot of people <laughs> thank you very much uh, now we have a question from Titus Research Institute is there any evidence of ship strikes related to these swim wheel activities? Yes, there is. Yeah, so um, often in some of the maneuvers that boats have to do around uh, either picking up or putting swimmers, I, there's again another disconnect. So when, um, when, when the boat has swimmers in the water, if something goes wrong to, with those swimmers, the boat has to get to them as soon as possible. They have to get the people out because there's a real danger there. And I know in some cases, and it, well, we had one case in the Bay of Islands where there were maneuvers going on and a dolphin def definitely got nicked by a propeller. This was many years ago. So we do know that this happens um, and it, it is a concern. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rosa Pires has a question. Which characteristics should have a, a boat? Um, I guess it's the question is which characteristics, uh, what, what type of boat has the least impact on the animals? I mean, you showed a lot of different <laughs> boats, really big ones or really small canoes, or I mean, do you have any, any input on that? Mm, it's a it's a very good question. When we started out, they were very small boats, and in Kaikoura, they were just little six meter boats. And in the Bay of Islands, and to this day, there's lots of places have small boats, often with very noisy outboard engines, and um, that noise travels considerable distance. There's some nice reviews of the acoustic impacts of of vessels. Uh, so you kind of have this acoustic impact from the vessel and, and big boats and small boats have different kinds of impacts from lower frequency to higher frequency sounds, um, which attenuate over different distances. But you also have the size and number of boats as well. You know, and so we often ha we had this discussion a lot in, in New Zealand over is it better to have four small boats or one big boat? 
And I would argue that probably one big boat is better. There's just one thing maneuvering. I've seen dolphins respond quite dramatically to um, very like kayaks. <laughs> they don't hear them and they get a heck of a fright when they suddenly find them there. Um, and similarly, I've seen dolphins, you know, just literally jump out of the water when someone you know dropped something on the hull of a, an aluminium boat. You know, it makes a great noise through the through the water. So all boats have an impact. Uh, yeah, and lots of conversations these days about electric boats. So maybe, maybe that's going to be the answer. Hmm. Now we have a question from Laura Santis. Uh, she says, "Hi, Rochelle. Has there been studies on stress levels in cetaceans when interacting in, when interacting with humans?" Yeah, this is, um, there's been some work done on uh, whales, I do believe, some of the humpback whales. I think that that understanding of the cortisol transfer levels from the stress event to when you could detect it if you collected, say, blow, you know, the exhalation of the animals, because that's the, the only way you can get it, unless you catch the animal take bloods, which is, you know, not going to happen under a, a normal tourism situation. So I know there's been a lot of a lot of us want to do this work, but I and I'm if anyone out there and who's listening knows more than me about this, please you know chip in and, and give a reply. But I think this is something that would actually be really valuable if we could do it. Um, there was some efforts to try and collect the blow from Hector's dolphins here in New Zealand, but it's their blow so tiny that they actually don't <laughs> make enough that you can get anything on the plate. Any um, reading so that was kind of a, a fun find <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so yeah it's, but it's a good it's a good thought all right uh, next question here is from uh, Will and Dolphin Conservation Society um, how important do you think it is to integrate scientific research into whale watching operations oh I think it's critical um, there's been some great examples I think over Cape Cod um, Provincetown there's been long long relationships between researchers many of whom are you know sort of very well regarded in the marine mammal science community um, and that close connection between scientists being on boats and in, in some places like Cape Cod but other parts of the world the actual scientists are, are guides as well you know so they they have this sort of dual role um, one of the things here that my career has you know benefited immensely from was being on the boats with the tour operators with the the tourists actually really getting a feel for exactly what was going on and understanding those sort of social components you know of the whole thing it's not just about us scientists sitting on our boat out the side looking in it's actually being amongst it and understanding the motivations in addition as scientists we're trained to look for for out for all of the things that are going on and I would often have discussions with the guides because they they have to focus on the tourists making sure the tourists are okay and safe and that that they're looking immediately that I was looking at the dolphins and so that difference in perspective was always really valuable and of course as scientists we read the papers and in, in a few quick discussions with the guides they're now giving better factual information than they would have time to, to get themselves, you know, if they were at home, you know, in the evenings, they've got busy jobs on those boats looking after everyone. So science, that relationship between scientists and operators can be hugely valuable because it also helps you form a good relationship and that's where you get change. All right, thanks. We have a question from Eric Hoyt here. Um, do you have any thoughts Hi, about COVID and post-COVID whale watching uh, moving more to land-based? with the economics of boat base being more challenged? And could that social distance messaging even help sustain sustainability by reducing human numbers and greater understanding that cetaceans need space too? Yes, <laughs> That's, I think, yeah, this COVID times have been very interesting. You know, a lot of wildlife has been given some real breathing room you know our footprint on the planet has been a lot less overall and and certainly um, 
the cost for communities and businesses um, who've lost revenue from this is the benefit for the animals. And in those places where we couldn't do land-based watching, I, you know, I like to think that that is being promoted and actively looked after with all the social distancing and, that, and things that we have in different ways around the world. And one of the things I think is this is a really good time for a reset by tourism, places that have really relied heavily off cetacean-based tourism. It's time to actually stop and reflect. So it might be time, you know, to really encourage our either the governing body or the agency or the that that industry in your local area or you as scientists to actually start leaning back in as we know now we're getting the vaccine and people are starting to actually maybe see that we could move around again like reimagining cetacean based tourism you know we get another go at it can we do this better either land based um, or in those places maybe where it's not land based how do we do this better how do we not undo all of those gains that the dolphins and whales have had while we've been away at home isolating. <laughs> it's a good question, Eric. Mm. All right, thanks. We have time for two more questions. So the next one is from Pinye Espel Pinye oh, here Antonio. Uh, do you know why there was a four year delay to act on all the data that showed that the population wasn't doing well with the current management? Um, yeah, it's it's uh, inertia on the part of the government who didn't want to upset the tour operators. And this is the thing, like big business often wins out. And uh, the Bay of Islands is a very big tourism area. There's lots of different kinds of tourism, including cetacean-based tourism. And our government agency is pretty weak. They even though we have a law and all the, they had all the power in their hands, they just didn't act. Um, despite, I would say, you know, excellent research advice. Um, and they, they really, yeah, they just didn't do it. They consulted, they talked, they had workshops, they thought about it. The operators threatened to sue them, you know, not that we really do that in New Zealand, but they're like, we'll take you to court to challenge your decisions. And this happens a lot, you know, where science isn't, um, it, it doesn't really get the attention that perhaps it could. Maybe that comes down to communication. But yeah, it is, it's a, it's a real challenge. And even with land-based whale watching and dolphin watching, which we can do a little bit, little bit of in New Zealand, um, you know, I've sort of tried to encourage them to invest in putting up good um, signage and, you know, having having you know a ranger or someone there to tell people what they're looking at but it's never really taken off in New Zealand so sometimes governments just aren't willing to do what it takes. Thanks and the last question from Gemma Veneruso um, do you have any guidance on how to develop steps towards sustainable whale watching in developing countries where regulation stability and enforcement in practice even with government agreement in, in principle, it is very challenging. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really great examples of what different communities and countries have tried. My advice would be to, if, if a community wants to start up tourism, cetacean-based tourism, the first thing you do is just get that community together and go, what does this look like for you? What do you want for your community out of this? And what do you want for these animals? And they will always say, oh, we want to make money. We want to make sure that animals are, are healthy and well. And, you know, you get these standard sort of answers. It's like, okay, so how are you going to do that? So make it that inclusive um, sort of socialized process where where everyone comes together and they own own the they own the industry and they own the problems and they own the solutions to those problems and then bring in research from the beginning that they can be part of that and then make sure that you get good research advice and feedback to them yeah just inclusive and i think whenever you include people together you always get better outcomes because you work at it as a collective i think that's the only advice i could give um, and and also just you know paying attention to where these animals are important to that community you know are they culturally important 
are they do they have some significance in their narratives or storytelling and then how does that community embrace that and make that a real key feature because if they value the animals more than just the money then you will always get better outcomes thank you very much uh, we need to to stop here but uh, there has been almost 300 people around the world listening to this and uh, <laughs> thank thanks <laughs> It's been fantastic uh, and really, really you, interesting talk. So, thanks a lot, and uh, thank you. And we'll thank you reconvene. so much. Thank you, and uh, we'll reconvene in Bye. five. Minutes. Stay safe. And in five minutes, we'll come back and uh, have the talk by Matt Peter Heidi Jansen. Thanks a lot.